What's up guys? How's it going? Welcome to another video here on the channel. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the Melanie Eribs case that was solved in a very peculiar way and whose story would make a good movie. So, without further ado, let's go to the video. Melanie Eribs was born on September 9, 1948. She was divorced and the mother of an 8-year-old boy. She worked as a nurse at a hospital in the city of Pacoima, a small district that is approximately 12 kilometers from downtown Los Angeles, California. On December 15, 1980, at 7.45 p.m., Melanie was on her way to work. That was when she had to stop her vehicle at a traffic light. At that time, according to witnesses, two men took advantage and entered her vehicle, one through the driver's door and the other through the passenger's door, leaving Melanie between them and under their power. After that, the criminal who took the wheel sped off with the car. The witness who was nearby told the police that he saw the two men enter Melanie's vehicle and then he heard her scream. Melanie was considered a great employee, reliable and punctual, much loved by her colleagues. So, when Melanie didn't show up for work that day, Everyone got worried and decided to call her home, but there was no answer there. The next morning, fearing the worst, a woman named Shirley, who was Melanie's colleague, went to the police station to report her disappearance. She spoke with Detective Patrick Conway, a veteran of the Los Angeles Police Department. She reported that Melanie left for work the night before and was never seen again. Shirley also said that a friend spent all night looking for Melanie. Six hours after the kidnapping, the police went to answer a call from a vehicle that was on fire on the Bromont Street. The police certified that it was Melanie's vehicle. They then started looking for evidence inside the vehicle, but they found nothing. Talking again to the witness who last saw Melanie, it was said that after turning the corner, the vehicle stopped and something was thrown out of the window. The police then went to the scene to check if they could find anything. In the place, there was a box of baby wipes that was next to the gutter. Later, the box was shown to a roommate of Melanie's named Ruby, who said she had seen that same box inside Melanie's vehicle. Still without a clue, the next day, the police asked the media for help in trying to locate the girl. They started a big search on the valley, went door to door looking for witnesses who might have seen something and went on horse patrols to score the area along the canyon. On December 17, 1980, two days after Melanie's disappearance, a 32-year-old woman named Etta Smith, who worked at an aerospace factory in Burbank, about 10 miles from Pacoima, heard about Melanie's disappearance over the radio and about the house searches that the police were carrying out. Immediately, despite not having prior knowledge of the case, she began to have visions. According to Etta, as soon as this thought crossed her mind, she had a vision that was like a movie, a very clear vision. And every time she tried to get rid of these visions, the images kept coming back to her mind and she kept wondering, why don't these visions leave me alone? In the vision, she said she saw a canyon, a long curving road, bushes, hills in the background, and a third path that led to something white. Etta believed that the white was Melanie's nurse's uniform and that it could be her body at the side of her visions. These visions were a clue to Melanie's location. Etta didn't know the name of the place, but she felt she knew it. She didn't consider herself a psychic, but said in an interview that since she was a child, she saw things before they happened, knew things she wouldn't know, and when she told her mother about it, she told Etta never to tell anyone about it. Etta ended up in a dilemma. She was confused and didn't know whether to go to the police or not, as they would think she was crazy. However, she kept thinking about Melanie and that if there was any possibility that her visions would help, even if she was considered crazy by the cops, she should do it. That way, the desire to help spoke louder and Etta went to the police station. Once there, she talked to a detective named Lee Ryan, 
and told him everything she knew, despite his skepticism. He felt that Ada had some credibility due to her excellent professional career and also because she had no reason to tell a lie. So he decided to see what she knew about Melanie's disappearance. The detectives showed her a map and asked her to show him where she thought Melanie's body might be. Ada marked the spot for the detective. It was a remote area of the San Fernando Valley called Canyon Lopez. The detective gathered all the information Ada could give him and told her that they would soon search the place. She had a strong intuition that Melanie was there and she needed to look for her as soon as possible. Etta decided to search the area that same day on her own. It was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon when she decided to go there accompanied by her children, a boy and a girl. They searched the area a lot, walking slowly towards the top of the canyon in their car. Etta ended up feeling Melanie's presence so she decided to go down the canyon one more time to see if she could find anything. When she was about to give up, she noticed fresh tire marks on the ground. Ada said that she began to experience various emotions and the strongest one was fear, and that somehow she was sure those tire tracks were from Melanie's vehicle. A little further down, they stopped once again, and that was when one of the kids noticed something strange. They entered the woods and spotted the body of a woman who was wearing white shoes. Just like in her visions, very scared, she quickly called the police and reported what she had found there. The police went to the scene, surrounded the area and carried out an investigation. The body was face down and had a serious wound on the back of the head. The features matched the Melanie's, so they took the body for an autopsy to make sure. After that, they found the body was actually Melanie Yerbs and that she had been raped and beaten to death. Everything so far was like Etta's vision. Although she had to find the body, the police began to suspect her. After all, not everyone believes in the supernatural. They thought Etta could be involved in the crime in some way, either directly or indirectly. She was taken into custody, where she was interrogated for hours went through a lie detector test that proved she was telling the truth. However, detectives claimed she was lying and arrested her, according to them, for involvement in the murder. Up to that point, the police had no evidence of the crime other than the tissue box found in the gutter. But the next day, a woman who didn't identify herself called the police station, saying she knew Melanie was killed with a large stone that hit the back of her head and gave no further information. On 20th of December, another person called the police station saying they knew who was responsible for the crime. That same person agreed to meet with Detective Patrick and gave him some names. The informant alleged that he overheard one of the criminals talking about the crime in the neighborhood. The first suspect was Norman Willis, a seven-year-old boy from Pacoima, who being a minor, got away with talking to the police. So, they decided to talk to Norman's parents, who named him after a friend of their son, a 20-year-old man named Lewis Morgan. Since Lewis was already a drug dealer and on parole, the police took him into custody. At first, Lewis denied having been involved in the crime. He later confessed. In his testimony, he said that on December 15th, he was joined by Norman and a 21-year-old third man named Spencer Nielsen. According to him, they needed money, so they decided to kidnap someone, and to Melanie's misfortune, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. When Melanie stopped at the light, Spencer got into the vehicle and held her, then the two other men got into and drove to Kenyon Lopez. There, they walked into the woods and abused her. Also, according to Lewis' testimony, Spencer Newsom said they should kill her, but Lewis just wanted to tie her up and leave her there. So he went to the vehicle to get a rope when he heard a noise. When he looked back, he saw Melanie on the ground and Spencer hitting her several times on the back of her head with a large rock. After they returned to the vehicle, Spencer took the stone he used to kill Melanie along with him. They drove back to town and dropped Norman Willis off at his house, then stopped at Bromont Street where they set Melanie's car on fire and drove away. 
Louis even said that Spencer dropped the murder stone in the gutter near his girlfriend's house, and then the stone was gone. Spencer's files already stated that he had been arrested for kidnapping a girl. That ended up reporting him, and he was arrested. He said this time he decided to kill the victim so she could not hand him over to the police. Detective Patrick then connected the dots. He found out that the woman who called the day after Melanie's body was discovered was in fact Spencer's girlfriend. Right after that, he went to the girl to ask her some questions. Once there, the girl said she would give him the stone. However, she would have to get it alone. He agreed. And 20 minutes later, she returned with the bloody stone in a pillowcase. On December 21st, 1980, Etta Smith was released from prison after police concluding that she had no involvement in the crime. Los Angeles department officers never publicly apologized to Etta Smith about her mistake. So, a year after the incident, she sued them for wrongly arresting her. During the time she was in prison, Etta developed dysentery and lost nearly 13 pounds in just three days. According to Etta's lawyer, James Blatt, she was arrested for murder only because she found the body in an unusual way, even though they had no evidence against her. After all she went through, Etta said she doesn't regret what she did and that if needed, she would do it all over again. Norman Willis, Lewis Morgan, and Spencer Nielsen were sentenced to life in prison for theft, abuse, and first-degree murder. They served their sentence in a prison in the state of California. Melanie Erie, born September 9, 1948, she was considered to be a great employee and much loved by her family and co-workers. She was kidnapped by three men who wanted money. The same man, in addition to stealing her, took her life. His murder was solved in a very unusual way. The psychic, Etta Smith, through her visions, managed to locate the body and that despite being arrested as a suspect, she said she has no regrets and would do it all over again. Well guys, that's it. Thank you so much for watching me this far. Best wishes and I'll see you next time.